Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday School class for um, May 24th, 2020. I'm uh, glad you're here. Last week we <laughs> I made a mistake. I said we were in the book of Genesis, and we weren't. We're in the book of Exodus, and we are looking at the tabernacle that God had Moses build the tabernacle and its furniture. <clears throat> and so I want to look at that. Last week we, we stopped in the middle of looking at the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And I'd like to take a break from that just now. And I want to show you the tabernacle itself. And uh, again, artist rendition and what it approximately looked like and how the, the um, court was laid out and the uh, things that were in the courtyard and then we'll look inside the tabernacle, and then we'll look at the individual furniture. So first of all, look at the um, the court. Inside the court, you'll you'll see, and and the Bible gives us the dimensions and everything, and we'll we'll look at some of that later on, not today. But uh, first of all, you see the first thing that people would see when they come in, or the first thing they would meet as they came in was the brazen altar and that is the first thing uh, that is on the uh, in, at the entrance a little away from the entrance so what the priest would do they would take the offering of the people the sacrificial lamb or the uh, goat or bullock uh, even the birds that they would bring, and they would um, examine them outside, <clears throat> outside of the main part of the tabernacle, outside of the courtyard. And then, once they saw that the animal was right for um, offering, then they would bring it inside, and they would they would kill it, and then they would lay it on the brazen altar and burn it there, or cook it. For the, for the priests to eat, and uh, they would cook it there, or sometimes they would burn everything, depending on the on the offering. But they would burn it there, on that uh, brazen um, altar. And we'll we'll look at that in detail in a little while. But then they would then they put the um, labor, the brazen labor, between the altar and the tabernacle, so the priests could wash uh, their hands and feet to cleanse themselves. And the Bible says that they would wash them uh, before, so they would not die. Let me find that there. Um, verse uh, chapter 30, if, uh, Exodus chapter 30, and verse number 17. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. Thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet that they die not, and it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. So they would wash right there at that um, that labor. I don't know if you recognize labor. What is a labor? A labor seems like something you would pry something with, and that's a lever, but I call it a lever. Some people would call it a lever. Um, but it, a labor is a, a basin holding water or a basin where you uh, would wash your hands. And that comes, well, we have a word called lavatory, and that is the, uh, the, the sink in your bathroom or in your, your uh, kitchen. It's a lavatory. Uh, I remember when I was a kid growing up, the uh, teacher would call the whole bathroom the lavatory. <laughs> Maybe some people do it that way, I don't know. But the labor is the lavatory. It's the place where you wash. And I believe the, uh, the Spanish word for wash is something like lave. Uh, and, and so that it all comes from the, uh, the same basic word uh, somewhere. But that's what a labor is. It's a basin to wash your hands. 
Uh, go over to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4. And what we want to recognize as we look at this picture, um, that this the, the, the tabernacle, the, by the way, the tabernacle of the congregation is the tent that is uh, inside the complete compound of the full tabernacle. Acts chapter 4. And so as God designed this, this uh, courtyard and this tabernacle, there's only one way in. And you can't you can't climb over the top. And some people might might have, but if they did, they'd die. God says nobody does. It. You've got to come in my way. If you try to get in any other way, it's not going to work. Jesus said, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me." And that's God's picture here is Jesus Christ. Acts chapter four, and verse number ten. That Peter is, is speaking here, and he says, "Be it known unto you all." And to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Now Peter had just told this crippled man, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. And so uh, this man was, was uh, uh, was uh, healed and he could walk and he says it's through the name of Jesus Christ verse 11 talking about Jesus he says this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders which has become the head of the corner neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved and so he says there's no other name there's no other way to come to God Jesus said like I said he said uh, uh, I am the way the truth and the life in John chapter 10 Jesus said I am the door uh, if any man comes from any other way uh, climbing up a window or any way it doesn't do any good and those people are thieves and robbers and they're trying to get to God the wrong way in order to get to God we've got to come through Jesus Christ and this tabernacle had only one door into the courtyard it also and, and not a physical door it's a curtain but it's only one way you can get in all the other curtains were fastened so you couldn't get through then there was only one way into the tabernacle of the congregation the tent that had uh, the other furniture in only one way into there and then the final thing is through the last veil the veil that is uh, covering the ark of the covenant there's only one way to get into there and not just a one one door to go through, not one curtain to go through, but there's a specific way they had to go, or they would die. And we just read that they had to wash before they could go in to uh, minister for the Lord. And so we see this tabernacle is a picture of Jesus Christ. And so let's go uh, now to back to the Ark of the Covenant and see what it says about the Ark. And then, uh, actually, what, what, what we want to look specifically on the Ark of the Covenant, remember the, the cherubim were over the top of it with the, the, uh, um, with the wings pointing toward one another on the mercy seat. Which covered the box or the Ark. And that uh, was where God was satisfied that the sins of Israel were paid for through the sacrificial goat. Uh, go over to Romans chapter 3. I mentioned this last week just as we were closing, but I want us to look at these verses now. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 25. Romans 3, 25 says, Whom God talking about Jesus, hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So he says his, he was <coughs> set forth to be the propitiation. And propitiation means satisfaction. The word here is, is the Greek word hilasterion. Hilasterion. And not that, that makes any difference to you, but there's another word uh, it's uh, hilasmos, which has the same 
uh, basic meaning. Go over to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And look at verse number 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So he is the propitiation. He is the way of God being satisfied. Uh, and and so the, the word is uh, hilasmos here, but hilasterion in uh, Romans chapter 3. Now I want you to see, because what we want to look at, Jesus is the way for salvation. He is the one, the only one, and his death on the cross satisfied God that the debt had been paid. Go over to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. And Hebrews chapter 9, uh, let's look at verse number uh, 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle. First tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, now he's going through that last veil that's inside that tent. went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. He couldn't go in without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. So he had to offer a sacrifice for himself before he went in. Verse number eight, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So as long as they had that tabernacle, or even the temple for that matter, the real true way to get to God was not made known, was not seen by people. As long as that, that tabernacle and temple uh, were alive or were there, nobody saw the true uh, way to get to God, and that was Jesus Christ. Now look what he says which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the surface perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So he's pointing out that <clears throat> the high priest had to go into the last veil into where the mercy seat was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And what he said, I didn't read it, but he came off of verse number 5, and this is the point I want to make out of all of this. All of this is pointing to Jesus Christ. Verse number 5 says this, And over it, and I was talking about the, the Ark that con contained the tables of uh, testimony or the, uh, the tablets of stone, over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Meaning they didn't have it and they couldn't point it out. But notice the word mercy seat. They were covering the mercy seat. That word there, mercy seat, is the same word we find in Romans chapter 3, hilasterion. It is the satisfaction. It is the place of satisfaction where God is satisfied that the sins of Israel were paid for. And the mercy seat or the propitiation that Jesus Christ is, is where God is satisfied that the sins of mankind are paid for. <coughs> and so the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant is the, the, the strongest picture we see out of all of this, I believe, of Jesus Christ making or paying satisfaction with his blood to God. God is satisfied. And that, I believe, is why uh, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, was inside the last, the holiest of all, or the Holy of Holies. And only once a year, the high priest would go in there to make an offering for the sins of the people. And again, the picture of, of Jesus Christ, they went in once a year. Jesus is 
the one-time sacrifice for all mankind. There's no other sacrifice. Nothing else needs to be done. Jesus paid it all one time for all time. We'll see that as we go on. Now I want to show you uh, these pictures of the uh, the different items of furniture. And, and as I, I uh, read the descriptions, I'll show you the picture. And so you want, look at the picture while I read, and then I'll have some comments uh, uh, afterwards. So first of all, the table of showbread. The showbread that the people put. It's called showbread. It was basically just bread that they put on this table uh, for the priests to eat. Let me read what it says in, the, in Exodus chapter uh, 25, verses 23 through 30. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of an handbreadth round about. And thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be for places of the staves to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, that the table may be borne with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and spoons thereof, and covers thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover withal, of pure gold shalt thou make them. And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me alway. Leviticus 24, 5 through 9. And thou shalt take fine flour, and bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. So this is a, this is a picture of um, the table of showbread. It's a picture, again, of Jesus Christ and uh, that Jesus is the bread of life. Go over to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And look what Jesus says about himself in verse number 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. <clears throat> so we see Jesus is being pictured again on the table of showbread. And now it has 12, 12 loaves of bread, each one standing for one of the tribes of Israel. Uh, so to show that God is covering all of Israel uh, through their sacrifices. And Jesus being the bread of life. Now we have the golden candlestick, the candlestick that was made. Uh, and they, they, you might see it referred to as a menorah. Uh, that's what the uh, Jews call it. It's a golden candlestick that the Bible calls candlestick, but it was actually um, used with oil. It's a lamp, and it has seven places for the uh, oil to be burned on, on this candlestick. Uh, look at, uh, turn to or just listen if you want, into uh, Exodus chapter 25, verses 31 through 36, and I'll show you the picture here. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds with a knop and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knops and their flowers. And there shall be a knop under two branches of the same, 
and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knops and their branches shall be of the same. All it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. So as I said, uh, that uh, this was uh, not just not candles. It wasn't like it had wax in it uh, to uh, and a wick, but it had oil, and they burned the oil uh, in these in these candlesticks. Go over to John uh, chapter eight. <clears throat> well, actually, before you go to John chapter eight, go over to Exodus chapter thirty-five. You might you might be there already, but I want you to see. Exodus 35 and verse number 14. Exodus 35, 14 says, The candlestick also for the light, and his furniture and his lamps, with the oil for the light. Now, the oil is, is important. Uh, I want you to see, and the, the way they made the oil is important in relation to Jesus Christ. First of all, the the candlestick brought light and Jesus said he was the light of the world so John we just read Exodus go over to John chapter 8 and verse number 12 John 8 12 then spake Jesus again unto them saying I am the light of the world he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of of life okay so Jesus is the light of the world he points that out he also tells us that since he's back into heaven he says you are the light of the world and so we have the same responsibility to reach out as Jesus did to teach others about salvation that God has provided go back to Exodus chapter 37 I want you to see this also because this would <clears throat> apply because of what God says it's I believe it's interesting since these things represent Jesus the uh, the light of the world but also the oil and uh, what how that relates to Jesus Christ also Exodus chapter 20 <clears throat> and verse number I'm sorry Exodus 27 and verse number 20, Exodus 27, verse number 20. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. All right, notice the word beaten. And uh, what, that, what I see here is how God relates Jesus Christ in that he was not just beaten uh, but he was he was bruised and the bible says and he was crucified he went through a lot of of, of uh, turmoil and uh, pressure when he was before he was crucified remember what happened in the garden uh, in the book of luke it tells us that he sweat great drops of blood and where he was when he was praying was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden the Gethsemane means a press. Uh, not oppress, but a press, like a, a grape press or an olive press to make juice or olive oil. And I, I have uh, looked at, into making olive oil, and one of the directions I have had was where you put the, the olives in a burlap bag or something and beat it with a hammer to break up the olives to get the juice out of them. If you've ever looked at and dealt with raw olives, um, they're, they're not hard, I mean, they're not uh, soft unless you get them when they're black. And I'm not sure how they, at what point the Israelites would beat their trees to knock down the olives to get their olive oil, but uh, even when you press them, there's so many pits in the olives, you can't press all the juice out. So you have to break everything up, break it up and tear it up, and then take the pits out so you can crush the flesh more in order to get the, the juice out to make the oil. So Jesus was in a lot of pressure 
in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then he went on to be beaten and, and crucified. Again, the oil itself is a picture of Jesus Christ. The olive oil, the oil olive beaten uh, so that they could put it in the lamp to represent the light of Jesus Christ. Well, now we have the altar of incense. Now, remember these, uh, this uh, table of showbread and the, uh, the lampstand or the uh, candlestick were both in the tabernacle, in that tent outside of the Holy of Holies. It was a holy place, but it wasn't the holiest. And uh, besides those two pieces of furniture, you had the um, altar of incense out there also. So look at the altar of incense as I read Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shittim wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four squares shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof. And thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. And two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof, upon the two sides of it, shalt thou make it. And they shall be for places for the staves to bear it withal. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning, when he dresseth the lamps. He shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. He shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering. Neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year, with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make an atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. The altar of incense, what is, what does, how does that relate to Jesus Christ? Well, first of all, uh, I want you to listen. You don't have to turn there, but Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8 and verse number 4, it tells us what, what John saw in his visions. He says, uh, and the, the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So he saw an angel with a golden censer um, that had incense on it, and the incense, the smoke, rose, and it says it rose with the prayers of the saints. So the point here, as John was seeing, was the incense or the smoke was as if the prayers went up to God. And here we see what I would say is uh, a picture of Jesus Christ, again, being the mediator between God and man, or the intercessor. Go over to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And look at verse number 24. Talking about Jesus here. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sin, and then for the people's. For this, talking about Jesus now, he did once when he offered up himself. And I just talked about that a little bit ago, one time. But here it says, he ever liveth to make, it, make intercession for us. And I believe he's not necessarily interceding for us by word, but because we have put our faith in him, he is still interceding for us. He is our mediator. We come through him to God, and the Bible teaches we can come directly before the throne of grace because we've already come to God through Christ. 
he is interceding for us so we can come to God. And uh, so the altar of incense uh, pictures the intercessory aspect of Jesus Christ for us toward God. Well, let's look, look now quickly at the brazen altar and the brazen labor, labor and we will we'll end uh, for the, uh, today. The brazen altar. Again, let me read uh, while you look at it. And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass, and thou shalt make for it a grate of network of brass. And upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof. And thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow with boards shalt thou make it, as it was showed thee in the mount. So shall they make it. The brazen altar. Uh, you notice that the uh, the pictures there show it built in a certain way. And again, uh, we're not sure exactly how it was, but uh, the rings for the staves were on the grate that was inside of the box that make up made up the altar, and that's where they would. Uh, burn the sacrifices, and I mentioned that earlier. <clears throat> Go over to Rome, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, and uh, verse number 22. What we see here, again, Jesus uh, sacrificed for sinners. He was sacrificed on the cross. Verse number 22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission uh, is no remission remission means forgiveness it means to be pardoned it means deliverance deliverance from sin that's what the remission uh, means look over at chapter 10 he, I'm sorry Acts chapter 10 not Hebrews Acts chapter 10 again we see Peter speaking and he, he says in verse number 43, To him, Jesus, to him give all the prophets witness, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So whoever believes in Christ will have forgiveness of sins. And we read in Hebrews that without shedding of blood, there is no remission. And so... The blood of Jesus Christ is what we believe in. Believe that Jesus shed his blood to pay our penalty of sin. <clears throat> and of course, the, uh, the sacrifice that, that was done once a year was uh, sacrificed there at that altar. And uh, the blood was, was taken and sprinkled on the mercy seat uh, once a year. And Jesus did that once for himself. And he is the mercy seat. He is the propitiation. Well, let's look at the brazen labor. And uh, then we'll, we'll be finished for today. The brazen labor. <coughs> Look at Exodus chapter 30 and verse number 18. You can turn or you can just listen. Exodus 30, 18 through 21. Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. And thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat, when they go into the tabernacle of the congregation. They shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations." Okay, the brazen labor. The labor, again, that picture shows uh, water on the top where the main basin is, and then it shows water on the bottom. 
There might not have been water on the bottom, but the Bible does talk about the laver and its foot. Uh, maybe somebody thought there should be water in the bottom on the foot so that they could wash their feet. But the water was used to wash the hands and the feet so that the priests could go in being cleansed in the way God had them be cleansed so they could offer the sacrifices and uh, go into the um, inner tent and also offer the sacrifices out the tent. No sacrifices were uh, made inside the tabernacle of the congregation, that separate tent from which was inside the courtyard. Sacrifices were all on the outside. They brought the blood in uh, to the um, tabernacle of the congregation and sprinkled the blood on the uh, altar of incense, even on the, the horns of the altar. <clears throat> but uh, the labor was used for water. And water is, is used in the Bible for uh, as a picture of cleansing. And there's two ways, two times, two kinds of water, I should say, uh, in, that is used. No, one, drinking water, and then washing water. Drinking water is picturing the Holy Ghost. It's picturing the eternal life that God provides through Jesus Christ. Go over to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. You can look in John chapter 4 if you want and see when Jesus talks to the woman at the well and says if you um, if you had asked me I could have given you living water that you could eat drink and never thirst again and the same idea is, is John chapter 7 when Jesus again uh, speaks about himself verse number 37 John 7 37 in the last day that great day of the feast Jesus stood and cried saying if any man thirst let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And so again, the drinking water, drink of this and you'll live forever. But then washing water also. Washing water is a picture of the word of God. Now I want you to pay attention here because there's two things we'll, we'll see <coughs> uh, as, uh, as, as we look at this. Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15 when we see washing water. Jesus says in uh, verse number 3, he says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now ye are clean through the word. So the word of God has washed them clean. And when we recognize what God teaches in the word of God, then we are washed clean because we put our faith in, in Christ. The Word of God teaches us. The Bible says that uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And we can't come to faith unless we have the Word of God and we are cleansed when we put our faith in Christ because of what the Word of God has taught us. Uh, we have the, the water of God. So washing of water uh, that... God, uh, Christ said, you are clean uh, through the word which I have given to you. Now, uh, go over to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Ephesians 5, 25, we see the relationship between husband and wife, but I want you to want to point out, he's talking about the church and the, its relationship with God. He says, husbands love your wives, <clears throat> even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Washing of water by the word, the picture of the word of God again. Now, the, the interesting thing here that we don't see in the passage we just read about the description of the um, labor is what it was made out of. It was made out of probably brass. We call it the brazen labor. It, it was either brass or copper. But whatever material it was, it was shiny. I want you to see uh, what God had them make it from and, again, how it relates to the Word of God. Look at Exodus chapter 38. Exodus 38 and verse number 8. <clears throat> Exodus 38, 8. And he made the laver of brass and the foot of it of brass. 
of the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He made the labor, they made the labor out of the looking glasses. What's a looking glass? Well, it's a mirror. A mirror that you can look at and you can see. You know, it says the looking glasses of the women. I guess the men didn't really care what they looked like. But the women would use the looking glass, so they would uh, take care of their faces and how they looked. But it was the looking glasses of the women. Uh, but the Word of God is a mirror. It's a mirror that points to us about what we look like. Not physically, but spiritually. You can look at the Bible, you can read the black and white letters, the red and white letters, and you see yourself. You see your real self if you'll pay attention to what the Bible says. And the Bible points out, you know yourself better than anybody else. You know what you're like, and you read what the Scripture says, and it reflects your reality. Again, not physically, spiritually. It is a mirror to the heart, to the soul. And uh, the labor, which is a picture of the, uh, the water, is a picture of the Word of God that washes us, and it's also made out of the looking glasses, showing us the Word of God, uh, the mirror that points to our hearts. The tabernacle is a great picture that God used to point people to Jesus Christ, to point the Jews to Jesus Christ. Uh, they didn't see him, but they had faith in God. And they looked to God to provide the way of salvation. And here, all the things they did pointed to Christ, even though many of them never realized it. So Jesus Christ, pictured in the Old Testament. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for <clears throat> being with us. Thank you for guiding us and directing us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember what we've heard and what we've learned, that you point us to Jesus Christ in many ways. Thank you for the pictures of the tabernacle and its instruments, uh, the, the main pieces of furniture. Lord, I thank you for guiding us. Help us as we look ahead to the time when we will be together, meet again and see one another. Lord, give us a great, joyful reunion. I pray in Jesus' name.